What's good, Wagin' World? It's your boy, Five Star in Vegas, broadcasting live as always from beautiful summer in Nevada here with my co-host, my guy, the only Sacramento Kings fan that I know. What's good, Spreaders? How are you today? Man, I uh, had a pretty good weekend. Uh, of course, we loved all the bets we gave out this weekend. Right? I don't think we got one wrong on the last show, did we? So, uh, yeah. always nice. But it's beautiful out here now, too. Uh, we had storms, which was fantastic because we needed the... The water and everything but the reservoirs are full it's green out here so uh, i enjoyed my weekend how you doing man beautiful day you know uh can't complain about uh spring in uh las vegas man it's been really nice the last couple of days make you want to get out the house man uh yeah. everything was been going good till this morning I, I i made a big bet on zang for some reason i don't know why <laughs> i hate betting these little uh little off-brand tournaments she was in charleston and I, I know Zang's a better player than Julia Grabner, but I say I like way. betting these tournaments. I just don't like betting favorites in them. These are when uh, the dogs come home, right? Because they care. They need the 250 points. Other people there are like, I just got my 100 G's for an appearance. Right. You know, right. <laughs> appearance be based on how far I, you go. I had a huge night last night, so that was disappointing to give back so much this morning. But it's okay. We keep it moving, and now we do the show refocus, and we got a – Good college basketball game tonight. We got some baseball. So uh, let's go on and get into it, man. Let's celebrate uh, our last week. We did pretty good on Friday in the past. That's right. Uh, the first one you gave out was the Astros uh, against the White Sox. The Astros bounced back after their first opening uh, home opener loss in 10 years, and they get the nice win over the, the White Sox. I didn't watch it. I did see the score, though. Um, do you have any thoughts from that one? The Astros played well, man. They covered the game. Uh, for the money line and the run line. Uh, Christian Javier wasn't sharp as he's been, um, you know, early, a little rusty probably from, you know, the break. I think he did pitch in the World ba uh, Baseball Classic as well, so he might be a little worn down. Um, but uh, the Astros do what they always do. They're not going to lose back-to-back -back games. They're just uh, too good of a team, too good of a roster. Um, it's plug and play for the Astros, you know, because it all starts up top, and they have, I think, the best owner in baseball right now, Jim Crane, and, um, he just sets the tone and hires the right people to do things, man. And him and Dusty Baker are on the same page. And um, you can always bet uh, the Astros off a loss, I feel. So I'll be probably looking at them today. But uh, as far as in, uh, who was the best players in that game, Jordan Alvarez, as usual, came through with a big go-ahead uh, three-run double. Uh, Kyle Tucker was outstanding. Great catch. He uh, robbed a run from the uh, White Sox. And uh, he also hit a two-run home homer. Kyle Tucker is just an excellent player, man. He's uh, one of the most talented guys in baseball, and I'm so glad he plays for my team. And um, the White Sox are going to be around, man. They have an impressive uh, batting lineup. Uh, I think this game is more in the national conversation, but another win. Uh, we had the uh, Rockies plus one and a half and the money line over the Padres. Uh, disappointing start for a team that got a lot of attention in the offseason. Um, to me, not necessarily that surprising. Uh, it's early in the season and people are going to overreact r really quickly when you have high expectations. But uh, what did you think about the Rockies? And um, what do you think about this national conversation around the Padres? They paid a lot of money, so they're going to get uh, the attention that they were seeking. Uh, you know, they're competing in that Southern California area forever with the Dodgers for attention because the Dodgers, just like the Lakers, um, even though it's a multi-team area, they're going to always be, you know, heads and tails, of, uh, heads above um, San Diego. It's just they got a bigger fan base. More people like the Dodgers because of the success they had over the years. And the Padres is always the little brother. Now they're doing kind of like the Jets um, are trying to do by spending a lot of money in order to compete uh, with Big Brother. Same thing the Mets are always doing to try to compete with the Yankees. And, um, you know, it's early in the season. Bob Mills is a good manager. I'm sure he'll get things settled down. What's hurting the Padres is they don't have the two biggest arms. Um, uh, Darish is out right now. Uh, and they have another guy. I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he's their top dude at the top of the lineup. They're missing two or three of their best pitchers right now. Um, so uh, that's what the Padres are actually having to go through right now. But as far as in this game, uh, Kyle Freeland was a outstanding man. Uh, only gave up one run. Um, got the win. Excellent defensive play that he made that uh, got him out of a jam in that game. And um, like I said, I feel like the Rockies uh, go by Chris Bryant. If Chris Bryant is in the lineup, 
uh, they're a formidable team. Uh, when he's hurting, he's missing out the lineup. Um, they can't score enough runs because you know with where um, they play at with them playing in Denver with that high altitude, it's always going to be about their uh, bats more than their pitching. All right. I came through. I gave you out the Keegan Murray over 11 and a half points. Um, that was like an example of I don't use like using game scripts on my sides and totals as much. But uh-huh. in player props, I think you have to. You have to take a stand. And, you know, uh, I worked out for us there. You know, the idea be, being we said we just saw the Kings blow this Blazers team out. Uh, they're most likely going to do it again. Um, so we want to choose players who we think are blowout proof. Right. Because that's the script that, that we're leaning towards. And that was an example of it coming through. And then the Kings come home and, and they have a disappointing performance as a 17 point favorites uh, against the Spurs. So <clears throat> it just shows you, right, that let down is possible at any time. It, it's hard for these guys to stay on for 82 games. So um, you'll hear a lot of people complaining about these big upsets. It doesn't surprise me as much doing the NBA um, for as long as I have. This isn't the NFL, uh, the teams aren't up for every game. Right. right, and you and you and that Kings game yesterday, you could tell they just thought we can win without defending. We'll just outscore them, and, and right. it didn't work out that way. So, um, you know, I'm sure they'll get back on track in their next game. These are the type of things that happen during an NBA season, and you want it to happen in a regular season game and not a playoff game. Let's move um, to most exciting game of the weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got the cover, but San Diego State gets the win, and they advance. They get the buzzer beater shot. The guy's foot's like a millimeter from the line. Um, it was everything that you're basically expecting when you when you get excited for a March Madness game, right? When you say March Madness is here, I can't wait to watch, even if I don't know all the players on San Diego State and I don't know the rotation on Florida Atlantic, I'm going to have a great time watching it. And that was the entertainment we got. What did you take away from that game? One of the best college basketball games you're going to see. Um Florida Atlantic smoked that game. I saw Lamont Butler, the kid who hit the shot for San Diego State. He won a game for me at Utah State earlier this year with the same exact um, play. Uh, he held it to the buzzer, got to his spot that he likes at his elbow and, and drilled it. Um, he's a big shot maker, solid, solid player. Uh, it seemed like they have about seven of him on the team, you know. Uh, that's just the type of uh, kid that they recruit over there, guys who put defense first, but they can, uh, you know, play a little offense. They wield the ball in, and uh, they're very competitive. So kudos to Lamont Butler and for the Aztecs getting to the, the finals. Um, they have a really strong fan base. Steve Fisher started that program up about 20 years ago after he left uh, Michigan and went over there, and he's done a great job. And his assistant, uh, Ducher, is still the coach now, and he's from his tree. You know, he's uh, a guy that coached under him. So – uh, it's a, a great tradition that they have, one of the better mid-majors that you're going to see in uh, college basketball. And hopefully with their appearance to the uh, finals, now that they can get up there with Gonzaga and start getting even better recruits, because who doesn't want to live in San Diego? It's you know, still the place with the best weather around the year in the whole United States. We had Florida Atlantic plus three, but I also had a money line. And, you know, I had them plus 650 to win this tournament. Yeah. I was really disappointed, man. They dominated that whole game. They had the lead all the way until the end. And they really were overcoming so much stuff. Their two two of their three best players did not play well. Uh, that center Golden, he I don't know what was wrong with him. San Diego State really gave him problems at the cup. Um, he didn't have his normal uh, efficient performance because he gets nothing but layups and dunks. And he went one for five with staying in foul trouble. But most of all, to Neil Davis, who I've been speaking so highly of. He had his worst game of the season, uh, only eight points. Um, he was 0 for 3 from the three-point line, 2 from 9 from the field. Uh, Elijah Martin with a great game, man. Uh, he's everything that I told you he was. He was. You know, that guy's going to play in the NBA for sure. And Dusty May uh, trusted Janelle Davis to be their best player, even though he wasn't having a good game. And I kind of question him on that. When you have a team as talented, as Florida Atlantic, as you saw, with all of those wings and guys that they have that can put the ball in the basket, make great decisions. If you see that your top guys off that night, this isn't the NBA where you're paying someone millions and, you know, the GMs looking at you like, why you didn't give them the shot? These are kids, man. And it wasn't Janelle Davis's night. So I didn't like how that last play when they were up uh, one and they had a, the final shot. Uh, well, it was, I think, uh, San Diego State. 
uh, would have got the ball back with 10 seconds, which they did. So it was about 34 seconds on the clock. He goes to John L. Davis. He has been the top guy all year. Don't get me wrong. He's one of the best players in the country. You know how much I, I like his game. He's been off the whole game. He was not himself. He did not look like himself. He's missing shots that he normally makes. Elijah Martin is cooking. I go the other way with that. You know, I let him uh, or, or Gaffney. They have so many guys they could have went to. Boyd, Greenlee, they, they should have went to one of those other guards and ran some action. And I believe uh, they would have got a layup. You know, they could have went to Rosada, the, the back of big man, because he was playing really well behind Golden and probably got a layup. Um, but instead, they go ISO with John L. Davis, and he, he kind of not even close with the layup attempt that he does because uh, he just wasn't himself. He wasn't, he wasn't playing well. So Dusty May trusted his big dog at the last play when the whole team had been playing well. And Elijah Martin had had like 24, uh, which is 1B. I just question what why he did that. I think they could have got a better play call than that, and they wouldn't have ended up in the situation that they did. But uh, once again, kudos to Lamont Butler. Kudos to uh, San Diego State and that program. They, they deserve this. From one of the best basketball games you can see to, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just a blowout, yeah. right? A, a decisive win. And you're going to give me the answer in the ball and parlay. But my main question after watching those two and you'll answer it in the ball and part of that. Of course, we'll break that down that game. But is it better to come off, right, the game where you're tested and you come through in the clutch, or is it better to have a nice, easy win where uh, never felt like UConn was going to lose and, to be frank, it never really felt like they weren't going to cover either, right? I didn't even ever feel like the cover was in doubt. Um, what did you think of the dominating performance by UConn? UConn continues their waltz. Uh, through the dance, they had uh, one uh, tough game in the NCAAs. Uh, they got pushed in the first half. I think it was 30-31 uh, against Iona and the sly Rick Patino, who's now going to St. John's, and I'm sure he'll do well until he's like 100 over there. He's just <laughs> one of those guys that doesn't age and just continues to stay uh, relevant. Um, but Iona gave them a push. After Iona gave them that push in the first half, and I think St. Mary's hung around a little bit in the first half. But besides that, the second half, they've been smoking teams. They've won uh, their games in this tournament by, uh, they beat Iona by 24. They beat St. Mary's by 15. Uh, they beat Arkansas by 23. They beat Gonzaga by 18. And they beat Miami by 13. So I think it's the perfect storm for San Diego State to really give UConn some problems because San Diego State specializes in making games close. All of their games are just like their Florida Atlanta game. Let's look at, you know, their, their last couple games against Creighton and the likes. They all come down to the last couple possessions, and it's simply because the way that uh, San Diego State plays defense. You know, they play real defense, man. And uh, as I've told you many times, their motto that they hang in their locker room is defense travels, and they live by that, and they play like that. And uh, I think that if they can get UConn in some game situations where now uh, it's not just a layup, it's not just we're playing free and easy, now we got to think, now it's a little pressure on, uh, that it'll benefit the Aztecs very well. But as you said, we'll get into that later. Miami, great season. Uh, they just didn't have anything uh, for UConn. Uh, makes me really upset that they upset Texas and Houston because Texas and Houston both would have gave UConn a run for their money, but unfortunately it didn't go that way. And that's the thing about college basketball. Um, it's a one-game situation. If that game you're off, it's, you're going home. And Miami uh, had you know two games where they were on, hitting all the threes, doing what they wanted. This game uh, they didn't defend, and that's what Jim – Laranego bases his defense on. Early when I saw Sanego just wide open for threes and driving to the basket, dunking, I know that Jim Laranego is smart enough to put in the scout net. Sanego shoots threes. He's going to be a really good NBA player because he can defend the rim and he can step outside and hit a three. So uh, he's a seven-footer. and He got you know to do everything he wants. He's that best player. There's no way he's supposed to be open like he was, but – uh, Miami probably was just more enjoying Houston and the fact that they got to the Final Four and it looked like it in that game. Uh, UConn clearly belonged. All right. There you have it. Um, but that wasn't the only college basketball action we had this weekend. Iowa, LSU took the floor. 
And you know what was awesome for me? It was WrestleMania weekend, and those girls are out there going like this the whole time. Oh, man. <laughs> I loved it. LSU got the win. Uh, I think that's the most I've heard people talk about women's college basketball. Um, so it's great to see them finally getting a platform. I know that you and I both enjoy the women's tennis. Um, so it'll be great to see you know people starting to enjoy that tournament as well. What were your takeaways with the LSU Tigers that uh, won the championship? First of all, I won big on this one. I had the Tigers, uh, the Lady Tigers, plus 145 and plus three and a half. I knew that that line was a bagger. They was just pumping up Caitlin Clark and putting all over TV the real people in, and they did exactly what they were supposed to. That's why you got twerps like uh, Dave Porton over there at Barstool's calling a young lady, you know, all of these names and stuff because of the amount of money that they were, uh, you know, roosted into bidding on a team that really wasn't even supposed to be there. I was a good team, a good story. And they were good all year, but they just athletically could not match up with LSU, and I knew that they played the game of their life against South Carolina, and uh, they weren't going to be able to carry that over against a squad as solid and deep as LSU was. Um, the media uh, created this storm, and I'm glad they did because, it, it, as you said, it brought a whole lot of light on women's basketball, and uh, those girls really represented the sport well yesterday. And even though it was a blowout, it was quite entertaining because LSU dropped 100 points and then everyone's looking at Kaitlyn Clark and uh, her shooting ability and things like that. It's pretty much a modern-day uh, bird versus magic, you know, ladies' version, because it divided the country. You know, the only people who were rooting for uh, Kaitlyn Clark uh, were people from Iowa and uh, people, you know, who have an innate bias for Kaitlyn Clark. And the only people that was rooting for Angel Reese were people from Louisiana and people that have a nay bias for Angel Reese, and, and that's why you saw so many articles today about the sportsmanships and how people were getting their feelings and calling out the young lady Angel Reese, and that's so silly. It was so uh, unnecessary, and now it's turned into what we, you know, already know. It's a culture class, like it's always been in America. It's, you know, it's 2023, and that part of America has never changed because the reason why is press coverage. Uh, when you're dealing with press coverage, you're going to have people who feel a certain way about certain individuals. And they're going to show it through their work. And uh, no matter how they try to pretend and say that all oh, y'all, everyone's covered equally, they're not. You know, it's, they're not covered equally. Uh, the reason why uh, the girl Angel Reese was following around Kaitlyn Clark and doing the antics was because if anyone watched the previous game, uh, Kaitlyn Clark had really clowned South Carolina. And like all sports, these ladies are all in a group. They're a fraternity. That's, those are SEC girls. I was from the Big Ten. They know a lot of players. Uh, Angel Reese transferred, I believe, from South Carolina. So she's friends with all those girls. And Kaitlyn Clark was doing some, you know, really, you know, arrogant stuff to them, like waving them off when it was time for them to be open. That's why LSU shot so many threes is because their coach was aware of that and didn't like it either. They looked at it as, as bad sportsmanship because Kaitlyn Clark kept saying, like, you know, waving her hand, like, ah, oh, just shoot it. Like, you're going to miss anyway to the girls in South Carolina. And then as the game was in and she was doing the you can't see me stuff afterwards. That's what's why LSU was so fired up. That's why they kept shooting threes. That's why they said before the game, they'll never disrespect us like that. And people are forgetting that part of the story, you know, and, and that's why it was so much fire in those girls. And that's why they felt that way is because it's like you girls are coming and clowning one of our people. Like we, you know, like this, is our family, like you, we fight in family, you know, in the SEC, but this is family. So that's what it was all about. But from that, it also became what we've always known, just a culture war. It's always going to be that because the media is going to uh, have people that, you know, feel a certain way. And they're going to put their personal feelings into when they're covering these stores. And then it makes it worse now that people are gambling. So they're losing money on it on top of it, too, when their hero doesn't come through and then they feel jobbed. You know, so it's just a, a bunch of controversy. But the great thing is controversy sells in America. So now. Um, the eyes are on, um, you know, women's basketball again. And Caitlin Clark will be back next year. So uh, it'll be exciting uh, to see what happens next year in the tournament. All right. Uh, I knew college basketball was winding down when I got some text messages about, from you yesterday. And they yeah. were about the NBA. Uh-oh, look yeah. who was watching yeah. the Hawks and the Mavericks with me. Right, right, um, right. And, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to dig up some some bad feelings on my part. Okay, so I had the Hawks minus three, whatever. I lost that bet. That's fine. Right. Losing that under hurt, man. 
The game yeah. set to go under with 0.4 seconds, and they call the foul. And I watch the replay, and I go, "That's a foul." Like I can't, yeah. you know. My only yeah. hope was that that they could have said, "Hey, uh, the foul was committed before he's shooting the shot." Right. Right. But I didn't know if they were in the penalty at that point or not. But regardless, uh, he went to the line. He makes one to two, which I knew he was going to, because it's Javale McGee, and he's like a 45 percent free throw shooter on his career. Uh, right, and, and they go to overtime, and in fact, the Hawks don't even cover in the overtime. They'll get they got the win though, right? I mean, I had two yeah. that were really close like that yesterday. I also had the Nuggets minus two and a half, so it wasn't the best day for me. Um, but I know you had some hot takes there. My hot take was I'm pissed that I lost the under, uh, but you really wanted to talk about what you saw from those teams. So tell me about what you saw, uh, particularly from the Dallas Mavericks. The Dallas Mavericks. It's horrible. I text you and I text uh, uh, Ricky, uh, Coach Coach Goodman. I had to mm-hmm. text him because I was like, are you watching this? It's making my eyes bleed watching the Mavericks run offense. And I told him, I think that they did this, put Luke and Kyrie together just so they could be mad when the other one has the ball, but now they can experience how your teammates feel <laughs> playing with you, with each one of you, because it's just really sad. When Kyrie gets the ball, he's just on this side doing his thing. And Luke is standing there on, with his hands on the ship watching, not moving, not going to get open, not sitting to pick, anything. Vice versa. When Luca gets the ball, Kyrie's just hands on his shorts. And I'm like, these guys clearly don't like each other. They clearly don't want to play with each other. And it's so obvious. And then Luca's just not a winning basketball player, man. And the reason why I said that is because he was not having the best day uh, yesterday shooting the ball. But – each time that an important possession came about where they could actually win the game or put the game away, he made sure to freeze out Kyrie. He'll take the ball, go into his little move, and he was throwing the ball to the worst shooters, just like Christian Wood had no reason even touching that ball <laughs> in order for the goal to, to the free throw line. And of course, he was one out of one and missed one, and it ended up where the foul occurs, and that saves him, because if not, they would have lost in regulation by one. Luca. If you know that your teammate is a Hall of Fame level uh, player like you are, you see he's hot, he's cooking, he's 16 to 27 <laughs> on the game. He got 41 points. You're 8 of 21. The game's tied, and all these big possessions at the end of OT and also at the end of the fourth quarter, you purposely freeze Kyrie Irving out the ball. I watched it. He, he went to the other side with the ball. He doesn't even look Kyrie's way. And then he runs his little slow stupid stuff, taking all his time up, and then throws the ball across court to a horrible shooter. Each time that they went down in this game in the fourth quarter and overtime, anytime Kyrie could get his hands on the ball, he just took off and went and got a layup so that they could stay in the game or take the lead or tie the ball game up. And it just was was really making me mad watching uh, how Luca was uh, running that offense, man. He It was selfish. And just like that Kalen – Clark situation, Luca gets the same treatment, man. He doesn't get called out for any of his arrogance. He doesn't get called out for talking noise to the refs and all the time doing that. So he don't get called out for flopping. He's always flopping. All these things, man. And then now you're a bad teammate, man. Like everyone knew when Kyrie came over there, it wasn't going to work. And number one, because of you. Yeah, Kyrie has a bad attitude, but he's played with superstars before and fit in with them. And and you you want to be your show. And you showed me that by when the game was on the line, you didn't involve a player that you know is probably at your standard or better, a first-team Hall of Famer like yourself, who's hot, he's making all his baskets, he's feeling it. Instead of you having enough sense to say, let's get the ball back to Kyrie, you had to show that it was your team and took two terrible possessions, one a long three that he missed and the other one when he passes to Christian Wood at the end of regulation out of all the people in the world you want to pass to at the three-point line. Like, there he's open for a reason, man. You're playing right into the hands of defense. As you and I know, spread, people just watching basketball and thinking they're running. They don't understand the schematics of the NBA. It's schemed up just like the NFL. Defensive possessions or these coaches and these defensive coordinators on these NBA teams draw plays anticipating what you're going to do. So they left Christian Wood open for a reason. They want him to be the one with the ball at this moment because, one, He's a bad three-point shooter. Two, he's a bad free throw shooter. So it's a reason that he's open. And Luca, of course, goes and falls right into the bag 
and does that instead of just playing with his teammate that's his peer that's hot. So I, I really lost a lot of respect for Luka, but I've been getting down on him more and more the last couple of seasons, and I'm glad to send Kyrie over there because what it's showing is that he's a selfish player, and I already felt that way. He's a player that has to have the ball in his hand, and he's going to have the same type of career that Harden has had where until he learns that and learns better, he's going to be a loser. And they're not going to even make the playoffs this year, and that's sad. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's a pretty big breakdown there. Um, I want to go through this one real quick because I want to get to tonight's game, but we also watched the Sixers in the box. Yeah, that's all you right there. I didn't watch any of it. <laughs> I hate delving into the MVP conversation because it just everyone just seems trench so trenched in. It almost feels like politics where, you know, you're not really changing anyone's mind. But it was hard for me to watch that game and not feel like Giannis was the best, wasn't the best player on the floor last night, which to me, conversely, made me think he's the best player in the league. Right. <laughs> so um, that was my main takeaway. The Bucks got the win. To me, a lot of that is home court. You know, I'm not going to, you know, just watch that game and think that the Bucks would sweep the Sixers. Um, of course, the role players play better at home, and we saw that last night. And my main takeaway is, you know, whoever gets it, because I understand it is a regular season award, uh, but I was watching that yesterday, and Giannis looked to be the best player on the floor. His athleticism is just head and shoulders above Embiid. I mean, they're close to yeah. the same size, and he's so quick and fluid. I mean, it, it's yeah. just unbelievable. I think that he – MB weighs probably, about probably a hundred pounds more than him. He, he, though he's a little bit, he's pretty much, he's like three inches bigger and probably three inches taller and probably about 50 pounds bigger. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. But I'm just saying like, yeah. MB looks like a center. Giannis looks like a forward and he's pretty close. Uh, to the but same size. I think MB has more talent at center him and joke is both than we've ever seen before. Cause they both can push the break. You see, like you and beat early in the season before he's worn down, he goes into these Kobe packages, these Jordan packages, these Akeem packages that he practices. So he's a little bit, he's one of the more versatile guys at his size. You're going to see seven, two, 300, you know, like the moves that he can make is ridiculous. But of course, Giannis, I think is uh, definitely more, uh, athletic than because and more fluent than him because Giannis is a wing you know he grew yeah from being a, a skinny guy you know a skinny guy to a lean guy into having muscle you know whereas in uh I think in B kind of was chubby and you know his size that you're supposed to be a heavy guy with all that height and he you know chopped it up and he still can of probably a little bit too much weight he probably would do well to uh drop like about 30 pounds him and Zion both need to become ve uh, vegetarians just while they're playing you know, like, why are you playing, man? If you care about your bread and your performance, you they're going to have to because those guys, it seem like food sticks on them. You know what I mean? They look real heavy during the season. So, uh, but I agree. Giannis is outstanding, man. Giannis is one of the best you're going to see. I didn't watch in this game. Uh, I bet the first half minus three because somebody texted to me. Oh, ski. So mm -hmm. I bet I bet the first half, and I didn't just was looking at it on my phone because I already knew that the Bucks were going to blow them out. It was a really – Easy down on NBA yesterday. Bucks with the blowout, the Lakers with the blowout, and the Suns uh, cover fairly easy. So those three were the teams that I won yesterday. So that's why I said I did pretty good in this sport. That I was a little ticked because I got to give it away on these uh, WTA girls. <laughs> we're going to get it back tonight, and that's what San Diego State takes on uh, UConn. I almost want to just throw the ball and parlay banner on the bottom, right? Because this is going to be yeah. a ball and parlay. I'm throwing the Let's banner on the bottom, break down the game. Uh, tell me who I'm betting. You know me. I watch the college, but I don't handicap it. I just bet what you tell me. What am I putting into my bookmaker right now? We're going to roll with your California kids, man. We're going to take that plus seven. And it, the reason why is that uh, San Diego State plays close games. That's what they do. Uh, they lock you down. They match up really well with UConn. Um, unlike the other teams that UConn has ran into, they have uh, guys like Lede, um and uh, Acops, you know, match up with Senega down low and uh, really like, uh, you know, challenge him at the basket, challenge him for rebounds and boards. Um, and you know they're going to defend the wing. That's what they do. They're the best man-to-man -man team uh, in college basketball. So UConn is going to have a lot of people riding the, the wave tonight. <laughs> Thinking because of all the blowouts that they had that it's their year. But I think that uh, San Diego State gets it done. I actually like San Diego State to win it outright. But for sure, uh, we're going to take that plus seven. 
Their motto is defense travels, and it does. They're about seven to eight deep of all good players, man. And uh, Lamont Butler's put them in position to uh, accomplish some great things. And also on 97.5, I gave out the over on Matt Bradley's points, and he got that in the first half, man. So he's shooting the ball well. He's obviously seeing the goal really good in Houston. And uh, I think that uh, San Diego State steps up. A lot of people don't remember that the year that we went into COVID, this very team, they probably missing one guy, I think, that went to the draft. I can't remember his name. Uh, but besides that, they're pretty much basically the same team that in 2000 when everything was shut down for COVID would have been the number one seed going into the tournament. So um, last year they were a little off. You know, uh, they lost in the first round because Bradley missed those free throws against Creighton. Uh, but uh, I think that this is a really sound team and they're a veteran team. Uh, UConn. Uh, it's been rolling. They haven't been in any tight games, and I think that if they can get this game to, you know, close in the final three minutes, I'd like San Diego State to pull it out. So we're going San Diego State plus seven and a half for the people, and personally, I'll be taking San Diego State money line as well. All right, you're on San Diego State, and you got one more for the people. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, so it's already on the screen. Uh, talk to me about the Houston Astros tonight. Houston lost last night. Alvarez was out the lineup. He'll be back in the lineup tonight. They also had their stud on the mound. Hunter Brown has pitched twice uh, in Major League Baseball as a starter, and his ERA is .93. <laughs> Under one. Uh, he's the next Justin Verlander. Same uh, pitching uh, uh, style, everything. He patterned his whole game after Verlander and then was blessed enough to have Verlander in his ear. Uh, coaching in the last two years, preparing him for the big show. So now the kids get the shot, and I think he's lights out tonight. So we're rolling with the Astros minus 220 to bounce back tonight with their full lineup, except for Altuve, but Alvarez will be back. All right, there you have it. It's the wagering world. Uh, no picks for me today. I took today off, and I'll be back at it tomorrow. All right, man, best of luck to you all. Let's have a great national championship game tonight, man, and we'll talk to you tomorrow as we get into this NBA.